like to call to order the City of Bothell Planning Commission meeting. Tonight is Wednesday, May 15th, 2019 at 6 p.m. Um, all commissioners are present with the exceptions of Commissioners Moreau, Cook, Kiernan, and Pystrup who are absent and excused. There's no audience, so there are no non-agenda public comments. And with that, um, commissioners should have had time to read the minutes, so I'll take a motion to approve the minutes in a second. Yeah, I have one question about the minutes. Uh, for staff president, uh, Steve Markala was here in the audience, and he also spoke, so I don't know if that should be noted on there or not. So with, with that amendment, I move to approve the minutes from May 1st, 2019. I second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 And motion carries with Commissioners Moreau, Cook, Kiernan, and Pystrup absent and excused. Um, with that, we will move into new business. Actually, we we're going to actually we'll probably hold off on that because I believe that our council liaison, uh, Deputy Mayor Dewar, is on her way. I'm not sure if she has any reports on that, so we can come back to that if that's okay. Um, no public hearing this evening, and with that, we'll go ahead and start with the first study session, 2019 Housekeeping Code Amendments Briefing, and we'll be led by Senior Planner Bruce Blackburn. Good evening, everybody. Uh, of course, this is our annual Housekeeping Code Amendment process, where we identify a number of those kind of things that you find in the code, and you say, oh, that doesn't work very well, or if some inconsistency, or just something that just is not clear. And basically what we're doing tonight is that, of course, no action is requested tonight. We're just going to do a PC discussion and feedback and have a nice discussion about some of these things. Um, there's 10 items in the 2019 docket, eight of which are scheduled for 2019. And I'm just going to go right into those. The first of them is clarify whether planned unit development clustering provisions should be applied to multifamily residential zones. And basically what we have is that the clustering provision in the, the planned unit development essentially um, identified, do you wanna hold for, okay. I wasn't sure if we wanna go to the council liaison report or not. I don't wanna interrupt you. I just oh, we just started. We just started, so we can. I can give, I, give it a quick, I have to say. It's day 10, though. So I guess with that, we will go ahead and, um, if it's okay, Chair yep, yep, yep. Chair, we'll move back to the uh, report from the Council Liaison. We are joined tonight by Deputy Mayor uh, Davina Dewar. Thank yeah. you. Um, sorry I haven't been here lately. I have a conflict on Wednesday night, so I'm glad to be here, though. Um, did you review, staff, did you review um, the legislative victories of the Planning Commission? We briefly did last week oh, okay. at, our, at our last meeting. Because I'm can, still doing we can, happy days. We, we, can, we can continue to talk about them. I think we should. Um, I don't remember what you said. I did watch the meeting. but um, So basically we had five uh, priorities and we got all five. So woo. Um, the first one being the 405 um, capacity expansions. Um, and I don't know if you went over this, but it was... Um, it's about $600 million and um, will uh, give us an inline, inline stops at 522 and 527 for our BRT and an additional um, uh, lane northbound, right? I think it's northbound. Um, and then I think we have to wait for a southbound lane, am I correct? But do you think it's both? Okay. Oh, okay. I believe it's both directions. It's changed so many from, times, I don't always keep up. From 522 to 527. Okay, yeah. perfect. So anyway, um, that was probably the heaviest lift. We didn't think that that would happen. I, I would have put it at 60-40 uh, or 40, however you do that, but the, the lower end odds. And um, Senator Palumbo was a big part in, in making that happen. Um, the mayor and I went down on uh, Saturday uh, before the vote and um, testified. The... Um, I think the hearing was at eight o'clock in the morning. So we were on the road by 6.30, but uh, it paid off, so. Um, and then additionally, we got 1.5 million uh, for downtown cleanup, which is cash, it's not matching. And then I think we got an additional two point, do you remember the number, 2.3 or something for matching from Ecology for downtown cleanup as well. And then 400,000 for Canyon Park. 
1.08 for the Both Atlantic Bridge, which we needed this year to um, because we had federal funds um, to match, and then um, the Police Academy, which of course we have just a few police that we're trying to hire in the city of Bothell. So, um, so anyway, that was it. This was our first, at least my first time um, hiring a lobbyist, and um, you know there were some people who weren't sure uh, whether it would be worth it, but I, I will say I think uh, the value in that was that um, they knew the critical times at which we needed to show up and make our voices heard, the hearings and, and whatnot. So um, I think for $50,000, we did okay on return on investment. So um, hopefully going forward, the council will continue to do that. So, um, and then last night we heard um, the shorelines, um, I don't know what we call it, master plan update. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, we didn't really have any um, changes. Nobody really said anything, so great job. <laughs> and um, and then uh, the Canyon Park master plan update, we also saw um, last night and um, we're super excited because that means Bruce is gonna stay with us for a while <laughs> um, and not retire. And then um, we're, we're going to stretch that project out about five years, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, finally, uh, did, I don't know. Do you guys get the stream updates? We got an update on stream health in Bothell. Um, I think it's worth worth watching mm -hmm. um, the presentation, but it's fairly depressing. So um, good though to put in context as we move forward with Canyon Park and, and what, seeing what we can do to. Um, be more responsible moving forward so we can have healthy streams come back to us. So um, I think with that, I'll let you carry on. Thanks. So if I could just piggyback on Absolutely. one thing you mentioned about the, uh, the um, lobbyist. Yes. So the other thing that was very helpful from a staff standpoint was um, that they, they tracked a lot of the legislation that we were interested in. Bruce is going to talk about one of them tonight, House Bill 1923, uh, that had, um, had some potentially very significant implications for uh, cities and the, the planning that we would do. At one point, they had a lot of mandatory provisions in there. They ended up being optional for the most part. Um, but it, it kept us informed because it was going through a lot of changes and gave us the opportunity to comment on that. And there was other legislation that they were tracking for us as well, in addition to the, the great work that they did on, on the five big items that we, the yeah. priorities that we had. That was, that was huge. That was a yeah. That's like a grand slam with it, it one is, more run added. They said that they had never seen anything like it. Yeah. They had never seen a city do that. And I mean, I, I think it's, um, the council worked really well together going down. I was down there, I think, five or six times. And the council members, uh, Agnew was down there. Pretty much everyone was down there. So I think that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, there was something I wanted to mention, but I forgot. So I guess I'll let it go. Well, to keep this sports metaphor going for a city of this size, we were definitely punching above our weight. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I mean, I think it was due, um, but yeah, the stars aligned for us for sure. So are you are you going to cover uh, with Canyon Park, uh, what some of the, the knowns now that we have with Sound Transit? Virtually the same thing okay. that you had last night. Oh, well, perfect. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Dewar. Um, those are certainly uh, significant achievements and we appreciate everything that the council did and the staff did to make that happen. Thanks for filling us in and thanks for being here. With that, let's go ahead and uh, restart the study session with the uh, 2019 housekeeping code amendments. And of course, these are amendments that improve, clarify, and incorrect, correct deficiencies or inconsistencies. And the first one is we've identified is clarify whether a development clustered provisions where the city basically allows a development to cluster themselves to provide things like open space. And there's incentives that go along with that, basically an increased lot numbers. And the question is, should those incentives be extended to multifamily residential zones? Right now the code's really not clear. It's geared primarily to single family residential lots. So that we do have some potential approaches and you know, you could just simply extend the bonuses to multifamily residentials. You could say, no, we don't think multifamily should, residential development should have that bonus or we can do different bonus unit incentives for multifamily such as an affordable housing provision. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, we've been thinking about 
as we do this, this linkage between the increased density and whether we can uh, justify the uh, need for an affordable housing. And of course here we would be actually be providing some additional units and that is it provides that nexus for us. So that is certainly one of the items that we could actually look for. And so we kind of like to hear from the commission as we kind of begin the discussion, whether that's something you'd like the staff to explore a little bit further. The second item is of course is there's a, we want to clarify the prohibition on rounding up of unit and lot yield numbers. Right now we have a lot of folks come and say, well, I've got 8.9 lots, can I have nine? Or I have 12.7 lot uh, units, can I have 13? No, the code and the plan are very clear that that's not allowed. It has to be a whole number. So basically what the approach would be able to, to, to make it very clear within the code, more than it is now, although I'm not sure how that could be, but we'll do the best we can, that it would not be allowed to do that rounding up provision. And that's a feature that we have within the, reg the regulations and the plan. Of course, the opposite would be, well, perhaps the city may want to consider rounding up, but we would have to do a plan amendment because the plan's very clear. It has basically the same duplicative language within the plan as well as the code. So it would be a little bit more involved uh, process to amend that. The thing one is to uh, amend a provision within Title 11, which is our administrative regulations, that give applicants 180 days to resubmit application uh, uh, requests from the city. Right now the code says 90 days, and that's just flat not enough. And 180 days also is in sync with our other permit style of uh, uh, resubmittal provisions. It's always 180 days. We try and give the applicants that much particularly if we have a very complex project where they have to do a really extensive reassessment of a traffic study or maybe a wetland study or something like that. So we, we uh, suggest 180 days. However, you can go more if you so desire, but we would like to keep it consistent with our other provisions. Um, one of the other things that we want to do is to correct a, a kind of a missed area within the code. Underneath a certain provision of the zoning code, uh, there is a statement that says you have to count uh, surface water facilities as a deduction from your lot area. And essentially what we have is we have in the city of Bothell what's called net buildable area. And that net buildable area is basically how we determine how many lots or dwelling units a, a project is allowed to have. Um, one of the things that we did back in, I think it was 2014, is as, as, as that far back, we removed that reg, reg, regula, regulation to encourage low impact development. Because low impact development, the better of those facilities are things that are like open ponds, large swales, detention, retention ponds, and things like that. We didn't want, want to have some type of a, a disincentive to, a, to applicants from implementing those much preferred styles of low impact development uh, techniques. So the concept was to remove that prohibition or that deduction, I should say, from the code. We just missed it in this particular section. It has been removed everywhere else except from this one. And of course, certainly we changed the plan when we did that as well. So this is one that it's almost like, okay, you have to do it this way. But we can talk a little bit more at One of the other items we have is that we have the North Creek sub area and it has what's called sub-districts. And there's a sub-district A and a sub-district B. And one of the things that we have learned is that the language within the code doesn't match with where the the uh, sub the sub district is, this is of course the North Creek sub area, and North Creek one Northeast one ninety fifth Street sub area I should say, and we describe sub district A which is in blue, sub district B which is in green, we have a missing area. This is probably supposed to be sub district B, but it's not identified within the code. So we need to basically either do one of two things, certainly add a map to the, uh, app, the code, or just basically include this within the uh, description of that particular sub-district. Um, one of the things we want to do is that also we've had some issues with our sign height. Um, we have with monument signs within the city of Bothell where we have a maximum height, and it's six feet, and it's supposed to be measured from the grade or the finished grade. Um, we've been having some issues with people measuring the sign area itself, but not the height from the finished grade. And well, no, that's six feet. That's how high it is. No, it's not. It's that base foundation adds a six, eight, ten inches, whatever it should happen to be. So we believe the best approach would be to simply amend the uh, sign code that very clearly identify that 
The term we use is city approved finished grade. That is a term we use throughout the code currently that identifies, okay, exactly where that, that grade would be. And just make sure it's the entire sign structure that is um, uh, measured, including the ba base or foundation. We could also insert a little illustration. And I, of course, I'm big on inserting illustrations and where you basically just demonstrate clearly that there's your finished grade, six foot maximum height, including the base or foundation. So that's an option we may look, we may, I may throw that into the code for you guys to take a look at as well. Um, the other one is that in the city of Buffalo, we have an interesting uh, housing product called detached condominiums. And it's one of those things that was a really hot housing product for a while. And it went into a lot of our multifamily residential zones, particularly our what's called the 5400A zone. And of course, that's a multifamily residential zone. It's not a great, a great level of density. However, um, we have a lot of these detached condominiums, and I'm going to show you a little photo of those. They look just exactly like small lot single family. Uh, same kind of a concept. You look at this and say, oh, well, that must be little lots here and there. The property itself is actually not owned by the land, the, the unit, oop, the unit order. The unit owner actually buys a, my apologies, uh, the unit owner actually buys a cube of land. That's how a condominium is basically established. They don't buy the piece of ground and then have their facility. So what we want to do is we want to have a definition that very it clearly identifies that this is a condominium. This style of housing is a condominium because it does follow the provisions of the Condominium Act of the RCW. And we don't want there to be any confusion. And we have had this in the past about, well, isn't this a single family lot? No, it's not a single family lot. It is a condominium unit. Therefore, you have to f follow those provisions. And it, and it gets a little bit technical, but we just want to basically have a very clear definition with our code to do that. Uh, one of the other elements that I think we'll have a lot more time to, we want to talk a little bit more time on is that Title 11 defines a bunch of procedural pro requirements when we amend our code or our plan. And basically what that does is it has, okay, it says when you look at the transportation element, the planning commission will consult with this or this, consult with that, you'll take a look at that and then you have other title provisions within the regulations. I put them up here, they're really hard to see, but it's in your packet. Um, but you can see how oftentimes you have planning commission and shoreline board collaborate and make it recommendations and there's a whole wide range of items that are listed here. One of the things about this is that we created this list when we first did our, G our first GMA compliant plan. And we did an awful lot of coordination between many different groups because it was the first time everybody had a, a real in, uh, interest in having a lot of uh, discussions back and forth. That's not so much the case anymore. Anymore, we have pretty well defined roles for our advisory bodies as well as our council. So one of the things that I think that I would like the commission to give us the permission to do is take a look at this and see if there's a way that maybe we can tighten this up to be a little bit more efficient. Um, one of the things that I think that what happened when we did the Shoreline Master Program, for example, is that we actually had to recreate that board because it, was, it had not been in existence for a while. We probably have, will have a similar situation now when once they finish the master program work this year and maybe a little bit next year, the board will probably go away until our next uh, provision. However, if you look at this, well, if we did any type of a element amendment, we really do have to take care of the shoreline jurisdiction, the board, if it's shoreline jurisdictions involved. That becomes really quite problematic if we don't even have a board. So we would like the permission to take a look at this and maybe come up with some ways to really make this a little more efficient. Certainly one of the things is that there's a lot of different titles and this is development regulations. These are the development regulations. Um, particularly titles involving utilities, transportation, buildings, and construction. Those are items that, you know, the Planning Commission would make a recommendation on. Well, it's all technical stuff. Um, there's not very much policy decisions within that. So we want to talk to the commission about the possibility of maybe making these items that go straight to the council. And again, we're talking about making things more efficient, um, particularly if you're going to look at it and say, well, we'd like to make this change. However, well, it's a technical requirement. We really can't make those changes. We don't want to have a situation where you're looking at something and not having any policy decision discussions, which is really more appropriately done during the planning, comprehensive plan amendment uh, timeframe. Now, time to talk about House Bill 1921, which was signed by the governor today. Was it signed today? Uh, 
or maybe Monday. yesterday. Oh, Monday. Monday. Okay. So, interestingly enough, uh, this provision's got some. Oh, I misspelled something up there. <laughs> That's what happens when I do these um, quickly. Uh, there's some in interesting things within that regulation, and I think that I want to just identify a few of them. One is that we have to have pr pr protection of permanent protective housing. Supportive, it, supportive permit, permanent supportive. supportive housing. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, and we want to make sure that we have a, a ability to put that into multifamily residential zones. That's one of the items that the legislature identified is that we have to allow that within our multifamily residential zones. We can't have it exclusive. Now, permanent supportive housing basically is something where you have a special, unique uh, support structure within a a house. You know, whether it's whether it's some type of a disability, whether it's some type of a another type of a protected use class of an individual. And you want to make sure that you have the uh, sufficient room within your community to provide those things. One of the other interesting things about this uh, bill is that there's some new affordable housing definitions uh, that we will want to take a look at with our partners, ARCH, to make sure that we are in sync. We do have an existing affordable housing definition, but we just want to make sure we're consistent with it. One of the other things that Mike, Mike uh, Director Cotterman kind of identified a little bit, there was a bunch of housing density provisions about where to put things like duplexes and things like that. Those are optional, but we still will want to take a look at that and see if there's some, some opportunity for us to implement those things, perhaps in conjunction with an affordable housing provision, because I think this has a lot of uh, uh, provisions within that. And of course, there are some ad accessory dwelling unit standards that we may want to take a look at that may be a little bit different than what our current standards are, so we'll want to review those. And our, we, we don't have a policy decision questions quite yet, but we do have a desire to bring that back to the commission to talk about them. Yes. So I just want to add to that. The, so these are all relatively new items that we've been tracking this as it was going through the legislature. We're looking at these, we wanted to bring them to your attention, where those there are things that are consistent with our existing policy, and we think they're fairly simple that we could include in housekeeping, then we would include those this year. Um, they would be in addition to what's already in the docket that the council approved. But we want to make sure they're minor enough that they're not going to take up a lot of additional time to do. If it starts to look like these are things that are going to have some more policy discussion to them, uh, then we would probably defer those until um, next year's docket with the council. But we want to at least bring them to your attention tonight. We're just not sure which ones we'll be including yet. Great. Thank you for uh, for that. So that's it. So questions and discussions from the uh, Planning Commission. So thank you. Great. I think what we should do, I think, is uh, just kind of head through and just do it, uh, if it's okay, letter by letter, just start at the top. Um, I think it would keep the questions maybe just kind of moving along more concise and you guys would be able to track them easier. So let's just start with the, uh, the A, the clarify whether uh, PUD clustering provisions can be applied to multifamily. Uh, thanks, Bruce, for the presentation. Quick question on this one. I thought you brought up a good point, uh, Director Cotterman, about trying to decouple what might be a policy change from otherwise simple code amendments, which we're just looking at conformity or uniformity within our code. This one, it seems like we can go lots of different directions, and I don't see that this is a slam dunk that we solve in one or two meetings. I mean, we could look at low income, like you mentioned, or other bonuses. Is that one that we can decouple from the rest of them, or does it need to stay part of? We could decouple any of these as we go you along. Bet. I think this, this is included uh, in the docket that the council approved. Uh, so our original approach, I don't think we had really considered the possibility of including affordable housing, for example, as part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. What we're proposing is that we, <laughs> that we move forward with this, that we have that discussion, and if it looks like we can include that and the commission can make a recommendation that would include a policy recommendation in this, in this case, it doesn't require a comp plan amendment, I don't believe, so we're okay there, uh, then we would continue to include this in the, in the, the packet that we would take to the council. If it gets to be a little more complicated and we feel that uh, you know the commission needs more time to work through that, we can decouple it uh, and then continue it either this year or uh, continue it on into next year. Okay, because I, I feel like this one could be fairly complicated. Like when we were talking about the wayfinding signs through Bothell, there's some public open space in the center of a multifamily development that most people never know and doesn't, you know, doesn't get to use. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think it's as straight cut as uh, single-family development. 
I could see that too. Uh, now having thought about it, um, but at the same time, I appreciate the fact that you guys want to kind of include it in the packet. So I don't know what other commissioners think about like breaking it off or maybe just setting aside more time for it and knowing that it's going to take more time. I think my position would be to take more time on it just because there's a lot of things that could happen that um, uh, maybe outfall from this these decisions um, long term. I just I feel like accessibility for the community could be a big component of this and um, I just appreciate taking more time to look at it. I think that that's a fair response. Though, looking at the schedule, it looks like we have this back for study session next month, and then there's going to be a public hearing on this. And of the other items, many of them seem pretty straightforward. So I think maybe we could see what you brought us next time as far as more in-depth information on this and, mm -hmm. and see where we go from there. No, no reason not to get started if we have time. I would agree with that. That makes that makes sense. I, if we can, we can also at that time break it off if we're we think it's going to be too entailed. But tonight we can, we don't have to make a decision on that. That's, that seems like that seems fair. Okay, so great. If I could ask a follow up question on that, then, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, so I've, I've heard in terms of the policy discussion and and the issues that you want to to address through this. Uh, one I've heard about is accessibility of the of whatever open space is created in the multifamily development if this goes that direction. Um, certainly we've introduced the idea of, of an affordable housing bonus system. Um, is, is that okay to include um, from the commission? I'm seeing nods around the table, so we'll take that as a yes. Are there other policy issues that you want us to bring back to you either at the next meeting or the one after that um, as we work through this? Uh, and we're not we're not married to the schedule right now either. You know, for as far as the public hearing, that's what we've estimated. But we can push that out if we need to. So e either tonight or at the next meeting, if you have some additional policy questions that you would like us to address, we can come prepared then with uh, with some analysis and discussion of what what that might entail. Yeah, that would be great. I, I know it's I know the commissioners here. It'd be uh, the clustering, getting that uh, mechanism. Uh, past was was huge, and I don't know, I don't know how uh, if anybody's taken it on yet. There, there are some people that have taken it. Mm -hmm. I, I knew there were a couple developments in in the in the works. So that maybe just like uh, anyway, you don't need to give us a presentation on it sometime. But that's good to know it's happening. And um, um, yeah, I like the idea of uh, just having the, the the accessible open space. So okay. Well, and, then the affordable, and then the affordable and or low housing component. Yeah, I, I'm always a proponent of trying to get low income housing as a, you know, as a mechanism into our city. So I'm definitely for it. I just am cautious that it's going to be a quick process, but not, not that we shouldn't try. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's see what it comes back next time. And that's a good point. I think particularly in the affordable housing component, there are going to be, um, there's going to be some analysis that we're going to have to ask the art staff to help us with. And I don't know what their availability and capacity is right now. Um, we're also going to be working with them on the multifamily tax exemption this year. Mm -hmm. So this might be something that we can parallel with that, you know, decouple it from this and parallel with that. We'll look at different ways to, to deal with that. But we'll try to keep it moving if we can. And if, if we can't, we, you know, we can always continue it into next year. Um, I will just add very quickly on the clustering. We've had uh, at least two, I think maybe three applications on the clustering that have been, I think, worked pretty successfully so far uh, for the single family. Uh, the other thing I was going to note is um, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a representative from the Master Builders Association. They were one of the prime uh, proponents for the House Bill 1923. One of the optional provisions in that bill was for clustering, and they took that directly from Bothell. So we were the model that they were using for that, which I thought was kind of cool. That is very cool. Um, so, with regards to that, um, yeah, and uh, if if you if you remember, possibly in the future, just if, if once one of those clustering uh, provisions or one of the developments happens, it'd be cool to just kind of see it and review it, mm -hmm. maybe as a uh, report from staff, staff or something report, like that. Just kind of, thing. yeah, I'd yeah. love to see that. We'll definitely have that for you. Just, 
Yeah, I, I would just agree with uh, with Chair Bleet on this clustering amendment. When we went through this initially for the single family zones, we were we were pretty fired up about it and to see it go to council and, and be implemented and, and see it used now is great. And if we can apply this to multifamily in a way that makes sense for the city and doesn't have unintended consequences, I think, you know, I'd rather do it, you know, sooner than later because it, it leads to more open space, more trees, more water facilities, um, all the things listed here. So can't wait to hear about it next time. You bet. Great. Let's move on to uh, letter B, um, the rounding up. Does anybody have any questions or points they want to make on that? This is one of those ones that I think seems pretty straightforward um, to just do it. Um, we, we're not going to go in and make a plan amendment to go the other way. So if this makes staff's job easier, let's do that for now. And if we have an attitude where we want to round down in the future, when it's time to make plan amendments, Let's let's have that conversation. Oh, so, you, so you're just saying to keep it as it currently is, but to put no, it, putting I, the uh, rounding up uh, prohib prohibition in there. I would I would add language that explicitly states that rounding up is not allowed. Okay. For for now, and if, like I said, if people have a change of heart later, it, it's going to have to come with the plan amendments. Um, I guess, uh, from my perspective, just working with other jurisdictions in my own job. Um, Bothell is kind of an outlier in that it doesn't allow rounding up. And so it is kind of interesting um, uh, for this specific jurisdiction having a different uh, approach than the surrounding jurisdictions. That being said, I don't think that it um, it's a, a make or break policy move right now. Um, I can echo what um, was said before that um, if it's easier on staff right now just to keep language as it is or to include specific language um, clarifying the position of the code, then I say go for it. I'm in agreement with Commissioner Hampton about including the language of, of prohibiting it. All right. Looks like you, we, you've got enough guidance on that then? Okay, great. Uh, we'll move on then to Part C, amending Title 11. about the number of days an applicant has. So um, anybody have any uh, comments on that? Questions? Is there anywhere else where um, we have that anomaly of 90 days? I mean, you mentioned that everywhere else in the code we kind of have a 180 day time frame. Is this the last remaining We believe so, we yes. In fact, one of the things we did is we looked, looked at that to just make sure that happened. Yeah, we want to make sure we didn't miss something else and. You know, when you do those uh, updates, you okay, we got every single one, and then you do a search and you say, oops, there's one, so. I think the, uh, what staff has recommended, the 180 days for application seems to make sense. Um, I do have a question, um, maybe related to this. Um, in complex submittals, such as maybe groundwater monitoring over the course of the winter months, if the application is submitted in the summer, that doesn't allow for monitoring over the winter, some other um, condition that not needs to be met over the longer period, is that specifically allowed or is that just on a case-by-case -case basis? We hope that that monitoring has happened before they make their application. And, and here's a great example of that. If the application comes in and they have not done that homework, our peer review will probably identify that. And we're going to say, well, we can't go forward with this application. Therefore, what are we going to do about these, these, these time frames? So um, it is hoped that that has been addressed before the application comes in. Doesn't always, but we hope that happens. And correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, because I'm not as familiar with the code. The 180 days, I think there's also a provision for an extension. If there requested. is, yes, yes. So so if there's a, some special circumstance where the applicant has, you know, and, you know some, we, we use it a lot when the, in the uh, economic downturn. Okay, yeah, we understand that the banks are not loaning, so we'll give you a little bit extra time. And we do have that option. Is that frequently used? It used to be. It hasn't lately, but it used to be, yes. Understood. Thank you. 
Okay, so it sounds like we've uh, 180 days giving you guidance with regards to that. Okay, good. And on to D, uh, with regards to deduction of surface water facilities. I had a little question about this one, because to me, um, I love the, the idea of lid, lid principles, and I think Karsten has a lot of background with regards to this. Um, I don't, uh, but I, I feel like there's a big difference, which, I don't know, at least in my mind, between a, um, and I don't, maybe I'm not understanding the question, but between a, um, like a like kind of a more of a concrete engineered vault and maybe a bioswale or something like that. So um, do you kind of know where I'm going with that with regards to, yeah, I feel like one, one justifies that and one maybe does or doesn't, but maybe you comment on that. Right, and one of the things that has happened is, of course, is that depending upon how much room a development has, they sometimes are forced to use the big vault. And they have to go really deep and they have to make it really large. And there is a certain requirement for that detention. Uh, that wouldn't be retention, that would be detention because it'll eventually go off the site, um, and which is not the preferred approach and one of the things our current surface water manual does is says you have to demonstrate very clearly that you cannot retain do with some other type of a low impact development on site before you go to the extreme of that big huge vault okay. so that's one of the things we like one of the things that was kind of interesting is that this is kind of the, one of the reasons this came in was we were getting a couple of green PUDs and our green PUDs talk a lot about okay surface water treatments like bioswales and rain gardens within people's yard areas. And we discovered this issue when we were doing those and saying, wait, hold it. Those all have to be deducted from the lot area and it just basically blew apart the project. So we did the plan and code amendments that are very well within the code except for this location. And it was just one of those things again where we missed this particular site where we had that citation. So um, it the plan currently does not deduct uh, service water facility. So technically you could say this is an inconsistent with our current comprehensive plan right now. But I, I take your point well because we would prefer those more open to the sky, evapotranspiration things. We'll get a little bit fun here about technicalities, but the idea is in, in many ways that's a much more appealing visual um, a facility than a big concrete vault. I think I heard a, a a little different nuance in your question though, so and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Are you asking whether this should apply to all surface water facilities or just those that are LID type surface water facilities? Is that, yeah, is I that think, more of the question? I think I, yeah, yes. But, but, or I guess it's more of a just it's something we should think about as we give our input on it. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, a, so. Because it sounds yeah. like the original intent was really for to encourage more LID. Right, and so if it's LID, then then I agree with what staff's bringing. Hmm. So we may have to look at the. How but this I don't would want it to applied. get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that that's a, a good way to, to thing to look at. Who, does anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah, I don't know that we're going to change anything, but I agree with you. When I heard this presentation, when we read through it, I had the same exact reaction. Like a concrete vault, kind of doesn't do the. Whole whole purpose of like a bioswale or keeping the water and you know getting it to the ground source right on the site versus um, just attaining it and tying into the stormwater system so I I agreed with I guess my interpretation but um, if it's consistent everywhere else but here I, I don't know it's right. some of the issue with that and Commissioner Kurd will say wait time out guys is that there are sites where you cannot do that open type of a pond. Uh, the soil just won't accept it. And that's where, and unfortunately, the city of Bothell is full of that type of soil condition. Um, uh, because we'd all much rather have a retained system where the water does not leave the site. It goes into the groundwater system, and, and you don't have to ship it up into, into a surface water facility at some point. But... Um, uh, I, I think that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on thinking about some of the provisions we could apply. There is a term for the more bio-friendly type um, um, surface water detention facility that I'm hearing here, and I can't recall what it is off the top of my head, but I'll research again and take a look at that. Do you know? Do you remember? Well, 
is it a treatment facility like it is a treatment facility yes and they had there's a classification that they've got for those and I'm trying oncology? to remember what those it, it, it's well it's we used adopted the King County manual but it's mm -hmm. use similar language I'll, I'll no I'll, I'll look it up thanks Bruce yeah okay all right, and then we'll move on to E, uh, clarification of subarea descriptions for North Creek. And feel free to just jump in. This is study session to you. Yeah, quick question, Bruce. Is Are we really looking at one area that's left out of A and B? It's those, I can't remember what they're called. When I lived there, it was called Archstone Apartments down there. And that's that's the one. Okay. So are you are you looking at us to bring that in line with either A or B recommended B yes. or to change the way that we Yeah, and I, we 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 should call it as it is included that area within subject B. Okay. As in, and and subject B usually the surf, the the building heights and the setbacks are pretty much code compliant um, except for this subject B where they have a little bit more height but we want to basically include that within here. And as you identified, it's all developed anyway. So it seems pretty straightforward to me, unless we want to reinvent the wheel. Well, that was another option, is just right. to eliminate the subdistricts and just go with the, the sub area designation of North Creek 195th. From, from a staff perspective and administrative, you know, I guess administrative perspective, what, what would that the advantage and disadvantage of that be? It's always better not to have sub-districts within your dis sub districts within your sub-districts. Um, um, but there is some utility to those because there are a couple of special height provisions that we'd have to come up with another way to term, but we could do that easily. So I, I think that if we were to decide, if the commission said, yeah, go ahead and explore the concept of, of removing those sub-districts in their entirety, I think your staff would be saying, oh, thank you, when what less funny thing in the code that we have to take care of. We're planners, we're masters of complexity. <laughs> we are. I, I think I would be open to looking at both ways and, okay. and making a determination. I mean, if it makes things easier and doesn't doesn't have unintended consequences, let's, let's do it. Does making these changes before the um, um, comp, the comp update does that make a big difference ahead of the game, or would it really not? No, fortunately, the comprehensive plan does not talk about the sub-districts uh, very much. Um, but I'll, I'll take another look at that to make sure we don't have some conflict there. When I first looked at it, I said, oh, well, there doesn't seem to be a conflict here, but I'll, I'll, I'll double-check that for you. Thank you. That's a good idea. It is just interesting that they were back in the 80s, I guess it was. Is that what you say? Mid-80s. But it was created then so um, just as long as we're not kind of like changing as, as long as we're yeah so it, it, I'm, it's worth I'm also okay with looking into that all right provision all right Moving on to F uh, with regards to the sign height <coughs> I think what the staff has here Makes a lot of sense. Everything under potential approaches. Now, are you on the potential approaches, are you one and two? Like both, do both those things have a picture and a? I'm a visual person, so I, I, I think that's that makes some sense too. Just throw a picture in there. Yes, either or both. And we say finish grade. I'm so uh, I'm not a developer or anything, but if they finish grade on property, um, what if you mound up the soil and then you put a sign? You know, you like if some landscaping or whatever, and you kind of go up. And then you put a, put the, and then you put the base, and then you put the sign. So how does that work? That would be the finish. That, that would be the finish. The finish grade. grade, the mounding. We would have to approve that, but yes, if the city approved it, right? Yes. So anyway. Okay. I, I had a similar question in line with that. How much grading can be done without a grading permit? Fifty cubic yards. Okay, so they could create a pretty significant mound if they wanted. I'm just trying to think of unintended consequences. Would, and then you, would you rather see language like predominant finished grade so they couldn't do that little oh, short Oh, yeah. 
I think that might make some sense because they don't have to go six. They could you could be four, right? On if your your landscaping goes up a bit, and then wouldn't we catch that when we 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 should we almost always do? But I'm just in case there's a desire to. And, and I guess my question is, if we introduce a new term, is that going to further confuse things? It'd just make it more complex, which we like. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No. Um, yeah. Isn't that what we're trying um, to do here to make it more sure, complex? Right? Um, I, I the, oh, okay. Usually. You know, the effort to put that extra little mount is mm -hmm. not necessarily all that worthwhile to the uh, uh, building owner because you know what? The sign is only six feet high anyway. Mm -hmm. And okay, well, another six inches is going to make all the difference in the world for people seeing my sign or not. I, it really doesn't happen very often. But some Unless people it's 10 do, feet, maybe. I can think of some, I'm not going to say that the businesses, but I, I've, I've seen examples where the mounding is several feet high and then the sign's on top of that. So oh. now I don't know if they went. I, Trying to think back of how high the sign is, but potentially, I don't know. I, I kind of like your idea of where you're going with that, Mr. Hampton. I, I don't know that I have a problem with it. I, it's just something that I raised the concern, and I wanted to to comment that I had the same thought. The uh, the other comment that I had is, you know, your illustration was really great. The ground was flat, but uh, in a practical application, the ground is not always flat. So would the six feet be from the the low side or the high side and how would we deal with that and and, and I'm asking more mm -hmm. in a sense that I, I don't want to create a really tough situation for somebody wanting to put a sign that meets our code and then all of a sudden they can't our definitions cover that so when there's a okay. slope we we have a way we calculate the the average finish grade okay I drew a picture so there you go because yeah. <laughs> you like pictures but okay I think I think that's all I th so I'm hearing one and two with some additional uh, uh, analysis of how we mounding. might address the mounding the prior to the, the sign installation. Right. I guess to answer the question that you, you asked specifically is I would support language that included the base of the foundation in the sign height to help make it easier for people to understand what's allowed and acceptable. Mm -hmm. And then we can just look at those couple little issues on the side. Okay. Thanks. Got it. Great. Okay, let's move on to G. Detached condominium units. Now, just Bruce, I heard you talk. Oh, I think when you were giving a presentation, so you said this happens a lot in 5400A. So I thought that A stood for attached. It does. Okay, but these aren't. No, and within the How's code, it? attached allows. You can do either. Oh, that's true. Yeah, so it, it, it's a it's that's one right. of our more flexible zones within the city. That's right. <coughs> Although you could do detached condominiums with an R4000 or even R2800, there's nothing that says you can't do this housing product within even a fairly dense multifamily residential zone. And, and one thing I want to um, add to Bruce's presentation on this is it, uh, he talked about the cube, and in most cases that's how it's been done. What we're hearing now from developers, and this has to do with the financing of the, the units for people that are going in to buy them, the banks prefer that they own the, the land <clears throat> excuse me, underneath the unit. So it's not a subdivision. It's... It, it's a different kind of animal, but there is still it's still a condominium because there's most of the area is still owned in common, but they do own that piece of dirt right underneath the the unit. Who does? Not in this the example. individual. The individual uh, homeowner. Not in that example, though, right? Yeah, not well, in that well, example. Okay. And, and here's the situation: this cube can go right to the ground surface or a little bit below the ground surface as well. So. Yeah, it just depends on how it's described. Um, anyway, yeah, so there's lots of different. It's an unusual animal. One I've not come across until I got here. On, on, yeah. on part one there, it, I'm just, is this the whole totality of what amend the code by inserting? Because uh, it goes to however, unless, and then I don't understand this. 
I had the however, same question. That, however, that, unless oh, that should be deleted. However, unless a company is, yeah, sorry. is extraneous language that should oh, be Oh, okay. Deleted. Sorry about that. Yeah, oh, no yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. It should be all other legal, the, including okay. common ownership of, all of, the, of, a, of the RCW. Mm -hmm. Yes. Apologies. No problem. The proofreader didn't do a very good job on this. It I'll was, do. I'll do it, better next time. It, it, it was me, unfortunately. <laughs> that was my job. God, I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, maybe else. I'm okay with what staff's guidance is here. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that this potential amended code language wouldn't change anything? It would just clarify what's currently happening and make things easier for people to understand. That's the intent of yes. it. Yes. Okay. It's hard to understand as it is, so I'm almost like, let's do it. But I'm okay with what we have here. So approach number one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thanks. All right. H. Uh, structures and practices. Now this is. Uh, you might want a little time to think about this. Yes. Yeah, so about talking about decoupling, but we don't necessarily have, we can just, do you want to just kind of go through it really quickly, or does any, any commissioners just go ahead and chime in? We don't have to do it in order, I guess, if there are specific things that jumped out at you. Will you talk more philosophically about how much more yeah. do you want to involve other boards and commissions? How much do you want to keep, yeah. you know, more uh, specific? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I mean, uh, in all honesty, I read this packet today for the first time, and so I haven't had a ton of time to, to put thought into which types of amendments would be reviewed by which commissions and how that would go. But as far as formatting of this, to me, I, and, and I might have counted wrong, it looks like there's you know A through F as far as different scenarios, and F, G, and H. And I just kind of went through and how many different types of recommendation processes there would be. And most of them would be planning commission recommendation to council or planning commission with collaborating with, sorry, collaborating with shorelines to council. And so maybe if, if type of amendment was, you know, siloed in, in the seven or six different types, because for example, Title 20, Title 21, and Title 22, those processes are completely different than any of the other ones above it. Mm -hmm. It might make it easier for people to understand. I, I don't, like I said, I don't have a, thought on how we should change the actual recommendation procedure today, but I think we'll take some time and think about it and I look forward to thoughts from the other commissioners. Does that make sense when I'm proposing? I agree, yes, and one of the things that, about this table is that, as you identified, there's some real funny nuances about it that certainly we need to clean up the table. I, I agree with you on that one, that's for sure. And. With regards to the Shorelines Board, uh, you were saying with regards to a lot of things that they have in here, I think, you know, they, it could probably be removed. Now, I say that um, we have a pretty good knowledge base on the Shorelines Board from what I've attended and what they talked about. So I almost, maybe I'd be requesting that they, and I don't know how this works with regards to how, you know, if they're meeting or if they're not and when they we use them, but... I almost think with almost under like natural environment element or conservation element, I, I, I don't know if it, I feel like it'd be, it might be helpful or not for planning commission to have kind of maybe some type of assistance on that front. Yeah, I and, I, and I think you're mm -hmm. really actually correct in that. I think there are definitely elements we want the shoreline board and the planning commission to have that collaboration. It's just a matter of uh, yeah. every single one of these things that we have to do that on. And so, right. you know, that would be something that we'll just want to have a little, we, we can do yeah. a little bit more thought process on that one. Uh, interesting enough, we have a couple elements that are missing from this table. One is our shorelines element. I was going to ask about that. And the other is our parks and recreation element. So we have to add the, amend the table in any event. So, okay. um, oh, it's there. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. My apologies. But it doesn't include the parks board. Correct. Yeah. So I'm sorry. That, that, that was my intent. Well, so. it, wait, it does. Wait, well, it does say parks somewhere. So, uh, yeah. Parks and Rec Board or under Parks and Recreation element? Yeah. Or are you talking about mm -hmm. something else? And, and I, I guess maybe in okay. some ways, it, you know, in, in, on that one, maybe it should be the Parks Board that is the lead and then they collaborate with others. And it just depends on how you want to approach that uh, type of discussion point. 
Yeah, I think that makes sense. That was your recommendation. I think potential approach number two, um, and that Something like that, that definitely makes sense. So I think what you have outlined to me, trying to condense this a little bit and get rid of redundancy anywhere we can would be a good approach as a first first pass. So just one thing I would offer to for you to think about uh, as you're looking at this and contemplating some potential changes to it is the, the Planning Commission has the primary responsibility for the comprehensive plan. So ultimately it is your your document that you're you're sending to the City Council. Um, that's not to say others shouldn't be involved in it because I think that's an important aspect of the whole process. What should that role be? So it may be that we define the role a little differently or a little better as well. Um, but ultimately, you're responsible for making sure that the entire document is consistent internally and externally, uh, and also consistent with our code. So that's why you're also involved in a lot of the code work that implements the comprehensive plan. So that's just a little bit more to, to think about as, as you look at these and, and contemplate. Yeah, and for that reason, I think that your recommendation number three which is kind of removing the Planning Commission from looking at the transportation, kind of the highly technical specific issues. Um, maybe it should still fall under the Planning Commission purview in this chart. Right. And of course, it, and, and it, certainly the natural uh, provision we want to do is that the transportation element definitely needs to be with the Planning Commission. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that linkage is continued, is, is still important that you have a look at that regulation as well. So, I mean, that, I think that's fair. I, I agree with Commissioner Cave's comment on that. I, I made a note on that for 15, 17, and 18, that if, if we do consider recommendation three, that, that you bring a little bit more detail, and I didn't have time to dig into what exactly is in 17, but it seems like transportation and land use are, are pretty tied together. They are. So if, if we look at recommendation three, I'd like to see a little bit more about what's in 17, and I can do that on my own. But um, the other question for Chair Bleed, your comment about the Shorelines Board review, and, and can you clarify, are you saying that if we recommend action, are you, some of our actions go to the Shoreline Board for review, even if those actions are outside of the shoreline jurisdiction or only for actions in the shoreline jurisdiction? I don't know. It was kind of a comment. It was, um, I'm not looking, uh, I, I, maybe just some guidance from the shorelines board, uh, but you're right. I guess, I guess their purview is just within the, the shoreline. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess that would be broken out separately and within the natural environment element, we'd be addressing everything as well as their sub area so I don't just as long as we can I, I didn't know what the intention was of uh, using the shoreline board in the future but I know they have a, a lot of knowledge and history with the town and it seems like they, they would even though it's not maybe actually in the shorelines jurisdiction they, they might be able to give some uh, good information with regards to the natural environment element but, but it wasn't to hand to basically um, I guess hand over our a responsibility for giving the recommendation. Okay, thank you. More of informational or, you know, so. I don't know how that would work, but I was kind of brainstorming. Um, let's see, and just, like, in, for instance, like under the historic, maybe, maybe this was captured in what you said, but basically in the historic preservation element, I mean, I don't, I don't even know, it seems like, I don't know if that would, be seems like that should just come from the landmark board, but maybe, but and, maybe and, oh, but maybe not because zoning and there's all kinds of other things involved. Yeah, and I think in that case, I think maybe, and that's where maybe we can change the lead. Okay, the lead perhaps should be the landmark preservation board with collaboration with the planning commission. And you know, I'm just thinking for along yeah. those lines. Okay, because you know, they as you identified the shoreline board, the landmark preservation board are experts on the historic resources within the community and it makes sense for them to be the primary yeah. lead. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things to think about is if, if you do want these others to be the lead, then, or do you want their, their advice and uh, input on a recommendation that you're going to make to the, to the city council? And, and I'm not advocating one way or the other on that, but I think it's an important consideration because if you're, if you're asking another board or commission to be the lead on something, 
then in essence you're saying that you will defer to their their recommendation to you. Uh, it's not to say you can't change it, but there's more deference involved in that type of a situation typically. Yeah. And again, I'm not saying that's good or bad, just it's right. more to think it's about. Good to, no, definitely. It's something I definitely have to think about. I feel like from there, um, I understand that um, the other boards do have a lot of, um, they have a lot more um, knowledge base, like you had mentioned, but keeping things consistent in recommendations towards council is important. And I think that's kind of the, what I like about planning commission is that it is kind of making sure that everything funnels down and it's consistent across the board so that we present a unified vision to the council. Great, excellent point. Okay, well, with that, I guess we'll conclude the first study session and we'll move on to the second one. There's still nobody in the audience for public comment. Um, so we'll go into the Canyon Park Land Use Alternatives led by Bruce Blackburn once more. Just going to make one more note here. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Can I make one more comment about the uh, the format for the last study session? I really appreciated the way that you laid everything out and then you gave us the kind of preferred recommendations. It made it easy for us to understand what you're looking for. Oh, and so if, thank you. If that was a test, you, you passed. <laughs> that was a, that's a very that excellent a point. We're, we're trying to do better. Th thank you for that comment, Commissioner Hampton. That's something we've been working on to try to provide clearer questions and, and what, what we're asking for from the Planning Commission. So I appreciate that. It shows, so good work. Thank you. Now on to something a little more interesting. Yeah, it's good, but still, this is, this is, this is really interesting, of course. Uh oh, yes. Uh, this, of course, is the Canyon Park sub area plan update. And we just had a very similar briefing before the plan, uh, sorry, pardon, <laughs> city council last night. I've been doing this too often. And basically, I just want to identify, of course, we did 2017 and 2018 and created a vision with a bunch of stakeholders out there. And these are just the primary items that had identified. Continue to be an economic driver, uh, a multifaceted neighborhood, connected to the natural environment and a transportation hub. You've already heard this before a few times. Just want to identify the progress we're making on this plan. And, and while a lot of it is kind of behind the scenes, we actually have had a lot of public engagement and we're right here. So you can see there's been a lot of technical analysis done and we're getting into some more public engagement opportunities in the future. So it's going to be continued to be very exciting here. Uh, we talked a little bit about the survey results and I just want to make sure I, you, I updated you folks that uh, we got 333 responses to the online survey we did, uh, which in our mind is just phenomenal. Um, and you, you know, I think we talked about, okay, 6%, almost 6% live within the Canyon Park area. And of course, it's interesting because we were talking about Canyon Park and Canyon Park's a pretty big area, <laughs> larger than we think it is uh, because it goes beyond our boundary quite a bit. But again, this is the, this is a very important uh, geographic distribution of the living folks out there. And then we look where people work, look at how much further it is. So people still travel a long ways away uh, to get to their work aspect. Um, it'd be great if we had this look like this, but that's something we're gonna work on in the future. Um, and you know, and of course, 20% of the folks work in uh, the Canyon Park area, 84% shop. So it has continued to be a very important retail area for the city. And of course, 30% own property. So that, that's really exciting to see that their um, participation. Uh, this is of course the vision map that we did uh, in 2018. And the question was, okay, is it still viable? And the responses was 44% yes, 36% unsure. So I think the idea is that maybe this is a little bit of, okay, what does this mean? Uh, we're not sure we got it. Uh, but if the people said they didn't think it was, oops, sorry, they didn't think it was, we asked them what it what what was their concern and it was traffic has gotten worse. Uh, so that is a really key component as we go through that, you're gonna see this theme a lot of times. Top concerns, traffic congestion, on arterials, traffic congestion on side streets. 
And then we get a little bit smaller uh, input from the lack of safe and comfortable places to walk, school overcrowding, lack of affordable housing, that's important, lack of parks or neighborhood focal point. And this is something that we found very interesting and intriguing, particularly our parks folks, they're really excited about that one. Um, some of the concerns is lack of retail options and loss, loss of small area businesses. And that's kind of like that small uh, local um, business group that we want to retain. And of course, limited transportation options, which are hopefully going to get fixed in the future. Um, assets to preserve. This is really fascinating. 84% uh, identified those natural features in that area. We should be preserving those. And that has come through throughout the entire history of this vision process is that people really enjoy those features, particularly where they have, you can see this one, trails. And those two and sometimes are pretty intrinsically linked. We have the North Creek Trail and uh, some of the other items. But also they looked at, look at this, employment opportunities preserved, 42%, small businesses, 42% uh, preserving those things. So there's a really strong natural features and recreation, but it's also employment business. We want to continue to have this as an important business area. Uh, investment opportunities, and this is, a pri I'm sorry, <laughs> priorities, and this is something again, relieve traffic congestion, 61, but, but look at this, new public park. So people are really thinking about how they're going to use those type of facilities and how they want that park space, uh, open space, all those things to be provided there. Of course, a lot of people are talking about complete the pedestrian network, which is really a key important. Improve transit, add more restaurants and amenities came in very strong at 19%. So it's really fascinating when you get, and 333 responses is really awesome. I don't think any of opportunities I've done in the last 30 years have gotten anywhere near that many. So it, it was very, really exciting. And of course, our primary message was social media. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, those really helped out a lot. So thank you very much to our former PIO who has gone on, but we're going to be doing more of that stuff. I need to talk a little bit about some numbers here, and this is activity units. And this is something that's really important that we understand as we go through this process. The Puget Sound Regional Council, or PSRC, has some regional growth center framework provisions that were just passed last year. And essentially what they do is they have certain mandates that have to be followed. Um, including existing AUs. And when I say AU, that's an activity unit. An activity unit can be one resident or one employee, either way. So 10, five uh, residents and five employees is 10 AUs or a activity units. Um, so the existing RGC should have 18 per acre. If you go over here, we have a 733 acre uh, RGC. We have right now 12,600 existing AUs within our RGC. The planned AU should be 45 per acre. That's what you should be able to accommodate within your comprehensive plan. And if you go over here, well, sorry. If you go over here, you can see that adds up to 33,000 planned activity units. That's both the residents and employees, employees. So that's a pretty good sized number. Basically what that means is we have to have another 20,000 some odd people into this regional growth center at 733 acres. Um, we also have to complete, comply with our Snohomish County growth targets. And within this area, we've identified within our comp plan that we can accommodate 4,500 new people. We have to make sure and meet that number because that's also part of our growth target. We have to make sure we have our population figure into it. But what happens if you have a smaller regional growth center? And this example is like 613 acres. All of a sudden, you start seeing these numbers change a little bit. Now, within that area, we have 11,300 existing activity units, but instead of 33,000, 27,000 is what you really need to do in your plan provision, which is 15,000 more, not 20,000 more. So, um, uh, sorry, and this is- Sorry, Bruce. Okay, So, just can you explain this reduction in size, acreage? I will in just a moment. In fact, we're about to hand out some documents here for you. Um, and this, this is a, just a table showing you a little bit more. Primarily what I want you to do is look at this table here that talks about the activity units that we have. And this applies it to the number per acre. And that's basically the uh, current number we have for activity units per gross acres. It's 17. And our activity units is planned for 28. So you can see we are still short. 
Um, this map here shows a number of features, including the current regional growth center boundaries, the subarea plan, as well as some the study area. The study area is a little bit larger than that. Um, one of the features that we need to identify to the commission, we did this last night to the council, is that Sound Transit is going forward with the acquisition of uh, this property to be used as a bus barn. That's 12 and a half acres. That will be removed from our ability to have activity units. So that's going to be something we're going to have to have discussions about later on. Um, and this just goes in a little bit more detail about the activity units needed underneath the current RGC boundary. Uh, and, and this basically just kind of goes through those numbers, you know, fairly quickly, a little more detail. But basically, you basically can see that we're, we're talking about 33,000. And depending upon how you calculate that, if you look at what our our numbers is for our current capacity, and uh, if you start going to the nets, we're talking about that. One of the things that I want to make sure we understand is that we have not applied a market factor to this yet. And that's one of the things that we have to do underneath our buildable lands analysis, and that's a 15 to a 30 percent market factor. That will make these numbers bigger, but basically what that says is that um, when we do our buildable lands, we have a market factor because there are certain properties that just won't develop in the course of your lifetime of your plan, you know, the 20-year lifetime of the plan. And that ranges depending upon the type of zoning you have and the type of uh, land use and some of the other factors. So one of the things that we'll have to be doing as we do this is we're going to have to start applying those, those um, market factors. We haven't done it yet. We're still working on that a little bit. And this is, of course, the potential revised RGC boundary. And I'm just going to go right to this map right here because you're interested in it. That's you before you have two maps here. And one is a live work and the other is called Business Park Plus or something like that. Basically what these are, these are land use alternatives that our, our consultant has identified for us. And essentially what these are, these are kind of considered like bookends that will be analyzed in our environmental impact process. It basically we identify so we can understand what the difference is between the two types of mixture of uh, uses and as well as activity units. Um, live work has about 32% population and 68% jobs. Business plus is basically 20% population and 80% and jobs. Again, the overall impression we have received from our community is that they really want to keep that jobs number high. And so it's a natural feature for us to go ahead and reflect that within our al analysis we're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the things you can see here is that this new line in the dashed would be the new regional growth center boundary. And of course, the council immediately saw this. Well, you're re removing the wetlands and some of the other areas that you just can't build upon. Uh, that's land that. If you can't build upon, why is it included in our regional growth center? It just drags down our AU numbers. So this is basically the revised about 613, 615 um, acre area that that basically is the focus of what we want to look go, look at going forward. One of the other features you're going to look in this map, you see the little numbers here that basically what the consultant has done is segregated this into blocks, and that's not the correct a great term, but basically just different areas in which we want to do a little bit more detailed analysis. The 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 big thing there. Sub districts. Yeah, I'm not going to call them sub districts. No, indeed, that's a good question. One of the other things you're going to look at is you're going to see little yellow circles and little red circles. Those are activity units in 100 person increments, and you see how they're stacked up within the different blocks. That's the kind of of activity level, level that activity unit level that we're going to be looking at achieving within this this project. The other thing the applicant, the consultant has done is he's looked at some of the retail intensity areas, trying to you know predict in the future where the logical retail areas are. And you can see, you know, some of them are very natural. Of course, they've got a lot of retail already, so that's a natural area. But we also we've got some areas that have no retail now that seem to be. Uh, a really good location to include some retail. Some are not quite as strong, others really strong. So these are all things within those two maps. Um, and of course, I jumped quite a bit ahead in my presentation, but um, you guys were fired up to see this, so I thought I'd just go ahead and shoot ahead forward a little bit. Um, this is the real heart 
of the analysis so far that we're doing for our environmental impacts. And this is you know, pretty close to what we'll do. And I mean, we're still gathering some information. The, com the council had some good discussion last night. I'm hoping we'll have some more good discussion, discussion tonight. And we can do some little bit of refinements on these, these elements. So um, the maps are a little bit easier to read than this, of course. But um, uh, this is pretty fun stuff to work on from our standpoint. And I kind of, I kind of jumped ahead, um, you know, the transportation news, okay, well, uh, you know, Deputy Director, uh, Deputy Mayor Dewar identified the new express toll lanes that are coming in with including the off-ramp, uh, Sound Transit is on BRT, and of course the Sound Transit acquisition of 12 and a half acres uh, within the RGC is something that we're going to have to work on. And of course, as we all know, the green line, the green swift line from Community Transit is in effect now, a uh, really fun ride. Um, and this is a couple of the real key points here, and this is a kind of a visual depiction, if you would, of that, that express toll lane off-ramp directly into the park. This is really important because this serves not just the park, but the transit facilities, and we've got two transit agencies that are going to be here really heavy duty. Of course, um, Sound Transit and Community Transit both are going to be looking at this area as one of their key areas, so it's really important that this project go through and the legislature and our city council came through for us, uh, big time stuff. Um, I just wanted to mention the open house we had. Uh, you may recognize a couple of faces in these photos. Um, really well attended and basically it was really fun to watch people start putting blocks. Okay, what do you think makes a lot of sense here? Well, we think this and what do you think that? And we did a lot of talking to, to, to folks about many different topics. And this was an exercise that kind of helped us solidify what those concepts would be. Um, and one of the things the um, consultant did is they refined that. They actually went back to their offices and started duplicating some of the things they heard and starting to, starting to put some of these unit activities within there as well as thinking about in the future what really good urban design elements they could uh, apply. So that ended up here. So next steps, as you've heard about, we have a $400,000 funding coming our way. That's going to let us do a whole lot. Basically, we're going to complete this project within by 2020 sometime, maybe earlier, maybe later. <laughs> but you can see this kind of this, this darker blue are the activities we're operating underneath this first phase. And it was about a $230,000 first phase we were working on that we got some money from the state legislature through Cascadia uh, College and as, as a matter of fact the red color it's supposed to be red are the things we can it do with green. that it looks green doesn't it uh, a little bit but it's green. I was sure I picked red anyway <laughs> I was this is late night thing I was doing um, so this is all the activities we're going to be doing with this four hundred thousand dollars that I mean, preferred alternatives, final planned action, environmental impact statement, public engagement, a lot of public engagement. We're going to do a lot more. Um, interestingly enough, as, as the commission is where we have some roads out there that are private. And one of the elements we have to have, we have to have a discussion about those becoming public roads eventually. And, and we actually have already had that discussion with the owners out there. But, um, you know, some more market analysis, capital facilities all kinds of really important features that we will do so when we get to the end of 2020 or sometime in 2020, maybe beginning of 2020, who knows, uh, we will have these this plan done and then it's just a matter of implementing the, the, uh, the activity and watching the area grow in the future. So thank you. If you have questions or comments or other fun uh, topics of discussion, please blast them away. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. A <clears throat> um, couple of questions. Do you think some of these figures are conservative or do you think that they're aggressive? Um, the reason I bring it up is the QFC development, they predict, I think, a thousand residential units, and that's a lot. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what Six Oaks is, but I've worked on apartment buildings and that's a, that's a ton of people. Now, remember, this is a 20 year projection. So the idea is that, yeah, it may not be feasible in the next five years, it may not be feasible in the next 15 years, but in 20 years, they really could see this. And remember the um, presentation we had on the Vision 2050 update, 
where we are looking at a number of a bunch of units. There is a very strong prediction for a lot of growth happening in this, in this, within this area. Whether it'll happen exactly this way or some other form will be one of the things that we want to talk about as we do the development of the plan because we can say, okay, here is the style of building we want and here is the uses allowed there. Here is the minimum amount we have to have. And we're going to have to have some kind of minimums to make sure we meet our, our, our AU numbers. But um, uh, as you identified, it may take us 20 years, maybe even longer. Um, it, uh, and keep in mind, part of the purpose of this is make, excuse me, being able to demonstrate to PSRC that we can accommodate all of that growth. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to happen within that time frame. What we've seen in actuality is in some places we end up with more than what we had planned for, um, which happens sometimes, and other times we planned for it, but it didn't all arrive within that 20-year horizon. So, um, and as Bruce said, it may not happen exactly like we've shown it here, but we at least have to demonstrate that we can accommodate it. The other piece of it that I wanted to highlight, Bruce mentioned in the, uh, with the additional funding from the state, one of the things that we'll do that PSRC is looking for is a market analysis. That'll give us a, a sort of a reality check, if you will, about what we're proposing in terms of the types of uses and some of the level of development that we're talking about. And just if the market isn't there right now, um, what, what would it take or what's the likelihood that the market will be there within the planning horizon? Okay, that makes sense. Um, I like the idea of trying to have everything a north downtown would need kind of contained on site, so a park or retail options. I mean, like we talked about, um, has there been any further discussion about a connector bus between downtown and Canyon Park in the future? I mean, we talked about this years ago, and with UW kind of expanding, it seems like it might make sense to share resources that we already have um, within our city. Uh, well, something that the city has just begun on, they have just begun the design phase for the uh, 522, I'm sorry, 527 connection or Bothell Everett Highway connection from our downtown area up to the, um, oh shoot, what is that? Where it becomes just, just north of Country Village or south of Country Village. Um, ah, the Red Barn District. The Red Barn District, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there is a, it, the, the city has embarked upon a design, uh, um, um, roadway design. yeah, roadway design to do exactly what you're after because the ultimate concept for Swift Green Line is to come into the downtown area. Okay, good. Um, and then I do like the reduction of acreage to represent what we actually build on and not taking into account all the wetlands. That, that wouldn't make sense. Um, and then just my general thought, I think if, I were to look at these three or four years ago, I definitely would have sided on the left. I was excited about getting some um, mixed use developments and more uh, residential units um, within this area, but learning and experiencing how great our economic center is in that area, I, I agree with the comments that you brought up that protecting those jobs and finding that balance between you know adding this new development type I think is gonna be key, so. Yes, now these are kind of intended to be bookends, you know, a, okay, one end and the other. And someplace in between is probably where we end up after we have a lot of more engagement and discussion with the commission and the council. So, um, but these are just kind of some, some interesting things. And, and as you identified, jobs and employment was really important. That's come through quite a bit in this uh, process. Thanks again for that presentation, Bruce. Um, I'm looking at the map, one, one thing, I was, and thanks for these maps. Um, so the, the district, I'm not super familiar with that area over there, but the part eight there, I noticed that it doesn't have, it doesn't have any increase in employment projected, or at least not 100 people. So is that, it seems kind of interesting to me. I would think, I don't know. And, and you know what, there's a couple of really important reasons for that. One is that, this area is, that area up there on the hillside, we'll call it, uh, one is it's pretty new stuff. And so the redevelopment opportunities are not as great as they are in some of the other areas where we have buildings that are about 10 to 15 years older. Uh, the other is that it's a long ways from our transit facility and it's up on the hillside and probably the more intense development we wanna occur is in this area close to that transit facility. We want to make sure that we have the ability to do more multimodal type of uh, you know 
movement. So more bikes, more pedestrians, more of that, and more transit facilities. Um, it's tough to get up on that hillside with your transit facility. So why would the live work one then have more employment gain? Primarily what, oh, sorry. Primarily what's happening here is that there's kind of a balance between trying to get some of these, again, it's activity units we're trying to achieve. So if you're going to do a few less activity units, because you probably can't get quite as many residential activity units in the same space as you can employment activity units. So you have to start spreading it out a little bit. And that's where that comes, okay. so, sorry, that's where that comes into, into, into play. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is here is that we're going to have a full presentation before the commission with our consultants and they can kind of go through some of the details okay. and some of the thoughts on it. Um, and part of it was what we received at the um, open house and, and some of the other engagement opportunities. Okay. Anyway, it's, it's a good Great. question. And one question with regards to, so uh, business B&O taxes, so just something that I, I want to better understand, I don't know if you guys can comment to it. So when we get a new business, um, obviously we get, you know, or the ones we already have and they expand, how, how does that help our, I mean, it's, maybe this is too much of a, this is a long winded question or at least the explanation for it would be, but what are we, getting more tax revenue from, say, a business staying locally or a resident staying locally? Or not a resident staying locally, or having more of a residential component? Do, does, it, does the city benefit more one way than the other? Oh, I can tell you from um, my experience with annexations and the analysis, the fiscal analysis that's done of those, is residential typically does not pay for itself. Uh, in terms of the taxes collected and the services provided. As far as, you know, uh, actual dollar amounts, do we collect more? I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, anytime, though, I, I think, you know, most uh, jurisdictions focus on economic development as one aspect of, of their, um, their programs, and a lot of that is because you want to provide a good job base, employment base. Uh, that also provides a good uh, fiscal base. For, for the municipality. Um, when a business expands or when a business moves into an area, even if there's not, a say, a B&O tax, there's a, a multiplier effect of those jobs being in that community because you have more employees than purchasing things at the retail stores and the restaurants and, and those types of things or buying housing in that community. Mm -hmm. So the multiplier effect is very important, you know, tax structure aside. Um, and then the value of the property itself commercial property is typically valued higher than uh, residential property. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. Piggybacking off of that question, um, I, this might be addressed during the market analysis, but during um, seasons of economic downturn, I would imagine that um, job growth stagnation could lead to a lot of the um, job centers regionally becoming a little bit more depressed in terms of the development opportunities. Um, whereas, because we're in a housing sh shortage right now, I feel like adding any amount of residential capacity would be worthwhile. I, is that reasonable or is that market analysis? Or uh, No, it's a great question. And one of the things that we're taking a very close look at uh, is what residential is currently allowed. Because the RAC zoning, the um, Regional Activity Center, did I get that right? Residential Activity Residential Center. Activity Residential Center, Activity yes. Center, thank you. <clears throat> 14 months, I'm still learning all this stuff. Um, it currently covers most of the, the Canyon Park sub area, uh, and I think almost all of the Regional Growth Center, if not all the Regional Growth Center. So we already allow residential, and frankly, that's one of the concerns that we have because it is there, the market is, there's a much higher demand for that type of development right now, and we're seeing that happen. In fact, we have, um, if you can point out in there, Bruce, where we have approved townhouse development right there. Um, I forget how many units, I wanna say it's around 200 or something uh, like that. 100 that. And 139 or 139, something like that, yes. So uh, in that range, which we can talk about whether that's an appropriate location for residential, but it is allowed and it is approved and it's going ahead. Then what had been proposed on the, the bus barn site um, before Sound Transit decided to purchase it is that one I think is 320 uh, units? About 239, I think. Well, I'm not even close. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. But, 
but townhouses again, and again, not at a density that we would like to see for residential in that area, and that site may, may have been a little more appropriate for residential. Then on the uh, area six that you see there with all the yellow dots, we've had a pre-application so far that for 530 units, that one I'm pretty sure about. You got it. <laughs> Finally got one right. Uh, those are apartments and that, you know, multifamily for that area. And that, you know, that is a, a pretty high density and that's more in line with what we'd like to see there. Uh, and in a good location basically for residential. So long answer to your question, th the market is there for the residential. We're seeing more pressure for that. We're a little concerned about the fact that it can happen in a lot of these other areas. I think the probably the the upside of that is there's not a lot of developable land in our regional growth center, and it's not at a point where we're going to see redevelopment of commercial properties for residential. But you're right. If the commercial became much more depressed and they had vacant buildings occurring up there uh, and they weren't seeing much on the horizon, they'd probably develop it, redevelop it for residential. So we want to make sure that we put some things in place through this process that the zoning we put in place is much more specific to where we want the types of uses. So, you know, we're a little bit narrower in what we what we allow rather than the full palette of things. So we'd be particular about the types of residential, the densities that we're looking for, probably have a minimum density in place to make sure that we're not underutilizing land um, and to be very clear about where we want to maintain that, um, the commercial industrial uses that we have there. So, sorry, very long answer no, to that, your question. Perfect, thank you. Can I add to that? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, one of the other things that we have learned from some of the um, businesses out there, and this is life mm -hmm. science companies, they've identified a concern with having enough space to expand um, and the ability for some of the small startups. In fact, uh, one of our, our prime uh, success stories out there is Cyanogenics. Sorry, Seattle Genetics started as a startup out there. And so we don't want to really lose that. In fact, that's one of the things they've added and don't lose that. So we want to have yeah. that business orientation out here. It's, it's really important focus. And, I'm, and I think I may have mentioned this to the commission before. Uh, I apologize if I'm repeating myself. But it, if from a planning standpoint, I, I'm just fascinated by this project. It's, it's unique as far as we can tell and that we're taking an existing, successful, well-designed business park that was really intended for it to be an employment center, it did not have residential. In fact, it didn't allow residential no. for a long time. And we're trying to create an urban, mixed-use, livable, walkable community out of that while retaining that, that economic engine that is so vital from the, the businesses that are there. We've looked. We haven't found any place else that's done this or is doing this. So I'm... I'm pretty jazzed about that, frankly, because I think we've got a really good chance to make something exciting happen here. <laughs> so I keep wanting to say this is a good start, but as the uh, the Gantt chart showed, we've been working on this for a long time, so it's uh, it's good progress. These maps are great bookends to see kind of what's possible out there. Um, one of the questions I had is is the conversation about road transference. How is that going? I would assume that they'd want to get rid of the uh, the maintenance costs and the liability for those roads. Have, have we run into any roadblocks with that, pun intended? Uh, um, uh, yes and no. Yes, from the standpoint that, interestingly enough, the Snohomish County Council, when they approved this back in 1988, actually did require that those roadways be turned over to the county at the time, uh, which is now the city, upon completion of the park. So it's always been envisioned that those roads would be turned over to some governmental agency become public rights of way. Uh, one of the issues here is that the condition of the roads, and that's maybe the biggest roadblock, if you would, uh, yeah. to that transference <laughs> and understanding what the roadway prisms, that's the engineering term they use, right. is, is what they are, basically. The, and that's one of the elements that we actually have had a pretty good start with the owners association about that and understanding what's it going to take to make these into a type of a roadway that the city would feel comfortable maintaining because once it's a public right of way the city has to maintain it so that's a really that's a really important topic of discussion that we're having right now okay i have a couple of things here if you don't mind sorry um but thank you for that and then if 
if this is more of a, a mixed use environment where we're commingling residential and commercial, not that I have to explain mixed use to you, um, have we had any conversations about about shared use parking to, to help keep cost downs of cost down of development where people are living there and they're home in the evenings and weekends, they can share the parking with the uh, the commercial development? Not yet. Stay tuned. Okay, but that's part of the, the plan. We will, yeah. Yeah, okay. we definitely will, yeah. That is, that's, uh, and one of, one of the things that's, uh, you know, it looks like we've, oh man, we've made all this progress, and a lot of it is just <laughs> understanding what we have, and a lot of transportation modeling is going on as well. So a lot of that stuff is behind the scenes, but some of the more exciting urban design things that we're gonna start talking about here pretty quickly. Okay, so then just two more. One, um, last week, two weeks ago, you mentioned to accommodate or to accomplish this business park plus, we'd have to look at some, you know, heights of buildings that we've never seen in Bothell. I think you maybe even mentioned 12 stories for the commercial. Um, one of the things that I would encourage us to look at is kind of the economics of building development as far as heights. I know that in, in Bellevue in some cases, they, they upzoned parts of Main Street to a certain height that didn't really pencil out for the developer because once you go beyond a certain height, you have to kind of move to steel construction and concrete and that increases your costs. And if you can't gain more than one story over the five over one that we see, then then it doesn't work. Um, the same yes. with underground parking. You know, there's, there's a, a spot where you have to get into before you can do that. So just something to consider. And I know with Director Catterman's experience in Bellevue, I'm sure that you're considering that, but wanted to put it on the, the dais here, I guess. And then the last thing, sorry, block seven looks to be the same site that you identified as the, the operations and maintenance facility for the BRT system. What is the plan to put residential there related to kind of the requirement for low income housing with the state legislature mandate of ST3? or is that a completely separate piece of property? So um, what Soundtrans has told us so far is that they would like to work with us. They're, they're recognizing the importance of that 12 and a half acres to our regional growth center and the capacity, future capacity of, the, of what we need to achieve. Um, they said that they would like to work with us in trying to figure out how to introduce some TOD to that site. Um, having said that, not being critical of Sound Transit, They've also told us that they need every square inch of that site for the facility that they need to build there. So I, I'm not overly hopeful that we'll be able to get something on the site, but one of the initial thoughts that we've had internally, we haven't had this discussion yet with the, our counterparts of Sound Transit, is that we might be able, if they can overbuild the amount of office space that they need, that might be a way to introduce some additional activity units to the site that we wouldn't have been able to get with the, the two to 300 employees that they're estimating they would have at that site now. So I don't know that residential will be realistic there. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily qualify for the 80-80-80 um, provision, if that's what you're referring mm -hmm. to, simply because it's probably not going to be excess property. Okay. Yeah, if they did have some excess property, then yes, it would fall under that, I think. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that's all I have for now. Thanks for all the time. Those are good, good comments and questions. That's going to be a lot of bus trips into that area. Um, 120 buses. 120 buses. Okay. Um, oh, I had one more question. I forgot what it was. Must have not been that important. Um, well, thank you very much for thank you very much for that presentation or both of those presentations, Bruce. Um, let's see. No old business. Um, any staff reports? It looks like we do have some staff reports. Uh, just a couple. So one, uh, we wanted to ask you about the July 3rd meeting. Uh, we've had two commissioners indicate so far that they would not be uh, present at that meeting. Uh, we've, we're not in danger of losing a quorum or anything like that, but it is the day before a holiday and it's, uh, you know, the Wednesday before a Thursday holiday and a Friday that probably everybody's going to take off. And if people are looking at a five-day weekend instead of a four-day weekend. Um, we're wondering if that's something, if you just want to cancel that meeting now and we can take it off the calendar. 
So if that's your preference, we can certainly do that. We've looked at our, our work program. Uh, at this point, we don't think that will be uh, a factor or a concern as far as what we had planned to bring to the commission. Um, if it is, we can look at scheduling one the following Wednesday on the 10th, and we would just do a 10th and a 17th that month or a 17th and a 24th. Bruce probably wouldn't do that, but <laughs> judging by the look on his face. So what's your preference for July 3rd? I'd be okay with taking it off the calendar. To, or, but, but, and so noting that if we need that, to have, the ten, have it on the 10th. Okay. But I don't have, I, other commissioners? Looks like we're already down two people, and so that, as, <laughs> Um, getting quorums together sometimes. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that we, if we, we put that on the calendar, we're not doing kind of what we did this past week, so. We would like to get the notice out ahead of time so yeah. that people know when we do the next Imagine Bothell notice, we would just note that there would not be a meeting on July 3rd, because there will only be one more Imagine Bothell notice before that, is that right? That's correct. I know Jason looks like you're not going to be there anyway, or? I'm, I'm probably going to be out. Okay. That day. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and cancel that meeting then, and then, but if the tenth, if we need, and we definitely can be here for that, the tenth, then let's uh, let's do that. Okay, I, I think we can work around it with our work program, but if it gets to be an issue, we'll certainly talk to you. Okay, great. And be, yeah, else please out. do, because we're here to serve on the commission, so we need to be available. Okay. So, and then that rolls right into the next one, just meeting attendance update. Um, we will update this to reflect uh, absence. And ex absent and excused for Commissioner Moreau Cook for this evening. He did let us know ahead of time. Um, so this will be not just an upcoming meeting and tracking who has indicated they won't be here, but also uh, a record of who was in attendance. And this is something that we'll uh, provide to the council um, when they do their next appointments, those types of things. So it's just additional information for them. Um, I do appreciate people responding when I sent out the notice. I only do that when we're down to four, just to make sure that everybody is still going to be here, that nothing has changed, or that you're not going to be late, so that we know we're not going to have a quorum at 6 o'clock, and if we're waiting, that we know when you're going to show up. So I appreciate people responding to that. But that's the only time that we'll be sending that out. Otherwise, we just assume we have a quorum based on what we've been told ahead of time. So thank you for that. The system seems to be working so far, so thank you. Uh, the last item that um, I added to let you know about, and I, I hopefully you already know about it, because uh, I think some of you have responded on uh, next Tuesday uh, from 4.30 to 6. This is before the council meeting. Uh, all of the boards and commission members are invited to join the city council for um, a meet and greet and an artist reception uh, here in the council chambers and in the, the lobby. So I hope... Uh, Hope all of you are able to make that. Um, Deputy Mayor, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, it, it just came about, I think it was Council Member Zorn's. Um, I brought it up um, when we were discussing, uh, you know, it's been about a year since we tried the council liaison and um, we had some discussion about what's working, not working. And um, this is just an, another opportunity to kind of build the community of our boards and commissions so that when we pass people on the street, we know who they are. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing when you, when you don't know someone's a board member, right? So it'd be nice to to kind of build that um, familiarity, I think, with with everyone. So that's that's what it's about, and we're hope to, hoping to do more. So we'd love to see you guys. And as I understand it, it's just a social event. There's no program or anything Correct. like that. Correct. Yep. Just an opportunity to kind of shake hands and talk. So and I think they're refreshments. Yeah, they typically have refreshments. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, cookies at the artist reception. So, I mean, it's Excellent. worth coming just to talk to the council members. Sir, well, right. there's also we, we'll sign autographs, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. That's all I had. Thank you. Oh, excellent, great. Um, any member reports? Seeing none. Uh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Move to adjourn. <laughs> I second the motion. Any uh, discussion on that motion? <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, motion carries unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you all very Thank much.